enhancing volunteerism. That's our today's agenda. And I'm, I'm proposing to work in such a way that first I talk and then Helen will share her experiences on doing some on doing inspiring ways uh, with guiding. And then after that, I hope we have some time to discussions for questions and answers, comments, ideas and thoughts. So Helen is an expert. Uh, on quite an expert on, on doing inspiring ways on, on guiding and scouting. She has uh, really seen the challenges there are uh, with many, many respects on doing guiding and scouting with uh, retaining members and also getting volunteers to lead the work. And she has, uh, she had the guts to do some uh, inspiring and innovative ways and she will be sharing those ideas and hopefully encourage and inspire you to, to in your MOs, um, find different, different and new ways of doing guiding. And I have been uh, leading to work, WAG's work on volunteerism the, these past two years, and at the end of this webinar, we will talk a bit about what WAG's is doing concretely on enhancing volunteerism. Great. Um, the next slide, please, Zoe. So where are we as WAGs? And now when I talk of WAGs, I, I want to make a little definition of the concept, because WAGs is not only the organization, the entity based in London with the World Bureau and uh, CEO and all the statutory bodies, that is also all of us, um, all together, all the MOs around the world make WAGs. So in a way, when I talk about WAGs, where are we as WAGs, I mean not only where are we as WAGs in London this morning, I'm also talking about where are we as a movement of girl guiding and girl scouting. And, and some of these traits that... Um, are mentioned on this slide, I'm sure you recognize them in your MOs. Certainly, declining membership is a huge issue uh, globally, and that's why WAGS has agreed in the last World Conference in Hong Kong, uh, almost two years ago now, uh, that, a, uh, that we really need to work on growth. We need to reach to more girls and young women and not only girls and young women at, as our, the age groups we are targeting, but we also need to uh, reach to more, more uh, volunteers, more adult leaders. Because declining membership also means smaller resources. And whereas we definitely cannot say that uh, all our resources are based on the membership fees only, but also other sources of uh, resources are getting smaller and smaller. So there's a, there's a tricky situation we are in. Now these are problems for and challenges for our organization, but then there are, are some problems uh, connected with the personal situation of many of our potential uh, members and also of our current members. And this is the less time con commitment. I'm sure you all recognize this, uh, maybe even in your lives, as volunteers, you know that you seem to have less and less time to devote to guiding, even though we love guiding, but there are just so many other things in life that needs our attention too. And this uh, less time commitment shows that um, because this is so a phenomenon globally, so globally uh, recognizable. So this is one of the key challenges we need to uh, attend to. And because we need to grow. WAGS needs to grow not only because when we are bigger, we have more resources to do nice things, but WAGS wants to grow 
also because our vision, current vision, talks about touching each and every girl in the world. So we want to grow also because we want to reach more girls and young women in whose lives we can really make a difference. And where are we as WAGs when looking at to your right and to your left? We are in a really bad situation regarding the competition on the market share. There are so many other pastime uh, leisure activities people can be engaged in. They have friends they want to meet, they have families to attend to, they have other hobbies, they have their work workloads. There is really big competition uh, out there on the market share of the time of girls and young women and of the volunteers. So there are a number of changes happening around and this means that we we really need to understand that uh, change is everywhere, change in the ways people live, change in the ways people want to devote their time on uh, charity work, change in so many, so many uh, different ways of doing things. So the volunteers are changing and this means that if we want to continue engaging volunteers as we do, because WAGS is a volunteer-led organization, we need to change too. And during this webinar we will address some of, some of these issues to make it more tangible, make, make the change needed uh, and the reasons behind it uh, more understandable and point to okay. some ways of doing, um, doing that change and bringing about that change. Great. Uh, next slide, please, Zoe. Um, WAGS, space for improvement. We love guiding and we know that guiding is the best leisure time activity, best way of life there can be. However, we want to grow bigger and we have had this uh, endeavor already quite some while now and not that much uh, of uh, achievements have been around. So we have looked really heavily on uh, what things there are that uh, hinder us from growing and what things there are around in WAGS that are the potential uh, uh, things that we can consolidate and do better in because we already are good in those things. Um, a few years ago we hired a um, company called Northstar who made a research with, uh, together uh, with five different association MOs in WAGS uh, from the, all, all of the regions in WAGS and they conducted a, a study with the key st stakeholders in WAGS, the parents, the children, the volunteers uh, about the pros and cons uh, the positive and the negative aspects of guiding. And quite some interesting results came from that study. And the interesting thing with these results is that uh, when we've been talking to people uh, on different occasions when we meet, when we meet our uh, girls or even volunteers around in different global events or regional events, uh, surprisingly, the same challenges pop up. So we believe that there is really some truth behind this story, that uh, these uh, key challenges mentioned in here are amongst the really crucial focal points uh, on our way to su success. Um, firstly, we have found out that we, as WAGs, that means that all the MOs, as well as WAGs in London, we can be quite inflexible in our use of volunteers. We often feel that uh, this is the way we've done and we value and treasure our traditions. And so we want to do things the way we've done them a long time already. 
a hundred years and even more in some of the MOs. So this has led to a situation where uh, the lives of the volunteers have changed remarkably. And we still are very inflexible in our use of volunteers. Uh, also, we have found out that we can ask too much of our volunteers. And this is certainly something that I can imagine that each and every one of you recognizes this in your own lives when devoting time to your uh, guiding and scouting commitments. Sometimes it just feels that there is too much going around. And this might seem like a very, very evident, but it isn't because we continue on doing the same thing. Even though we should uh, maybe sit down, lean back and say, hang on, should we do something about this? Thirdly, we have found out that uh, guiding and WAGs is not perceived, perceived as very inclusive in the end. This is surprising because we say that we are open to all, but as a matter of fact we are not. And many people feel that they are not welcome, many people feel that they are, uh, this is not really their thing, that they uh, could easily do something for us, but somehow WAGS is not, guiding is not that inclusive as it says it is clearly easier said than done. Uh, fourthly, program, our really core business, that's what we offer, that's our product we offer to the girls and young women out there. But also the program is the thing that we offer in a way also to our volunteers because we ask them to uh, do the program, lead the program, enable girls and young women to do the program. So, no doubt that some of our programs maybe are too functional and certainly that they're not fun because in the end that's what people look for when they turn to us. They want to have fun. So, Sometimes, simply, our program, program offer is not uh, quite as uh, enticing uh, and inspirational as it could be. And fifthly, and this is major, of major importance with regards to volunteering, when we all the time talk of uh, our focus on girls and young women who surely are our target group, uh, but too often we ignore the wants and the needs of the volunteers. And this is really bad because without the volunteers we certainly don't have the girls and the young women either. So it's these challenges that North Star, uh, the people who came from an, came with an outside perspective on guiding around the world, in all of the five different regions. These are the points they pointed out to us that here you really need to do better and here you really need to think over what you're doing. The old business model is not enough anymore. Something needs to change in WAGS. The next slide, Zoe, please. So what must we do differently? North Star was great because they not only left us with the uh, questions, they also gave us some answers. And we really believe that these answers in a way point to the uh, successes ahead in the future for WAGs and for all the MOs. It's, it's these answers that relate to the questions posed uh, by volunteers and girls and young women in the North Star report. So one point is that we actually need to find roles to match 
the time available that the volunteers are willing to give us. This means that uh, when we before maybe had a project and then we were looking at, okay, what kind of volunteers we need to do this project and run this project. In the future, this kind of approach must to be completely upside down. We actually need to find roles to match the time available. We already have volunteers out there. We need to match our way of doing things uh, to their needs and offerings. One thing also uh, that relates to both the retaining, keeping the uh, previous current volunteers, but also uh, recruiting completely new volunteers. So we need to make it easy to volunteer both to new and to uh, returning volunteers. Many have been volunteering with us, but unfortunately many have also left us. So we need to see the reasons why they have left us, and maybe uh, the answer number one, we need to find roles to match the time available, is an answer to this second, second point as well. One thing that volunteers certainly are looking for uh, are ways to develop themselves. Volunteers are not here only to offer from themselves to other, to girls and young women around. But actually volunteers too, they want to gain something. And it, it can be a nice gain to see the smile on the faces of the girls and young women, but always it's not enough. So we need to create spaces uh, for volunteers in developing themselves too. Hugely important is the rewarding and recognizing the achievements of volunteering. Certainly a simple thank you is nice, but it's not enough. Quite a number of our volunteers really seek rewards and recognition one way or another for their achievements. Also, we need to acknowledge and respect the social motivations of volunteers. That means that the volunteers uh, too have social motivations. They are here to meet their friends, the other volunteers. They are here to spend time with their friends, the other volunteers. They might not be here solely on, uh, for the girls and young women, but on, uh, on, the, on their personal social gain. And that's why when thinking and designing programs also for volunteers, we need to find a nice balance between the time volunteers give for the movement and the time volunteers gain for their personal purposes and personal needs. And finally, we should ensure our programs are diverse, modern, and fun. This means that uh, we need to be out there asking girls and young women what do, the, what do they want. But also we need to ask the volunteers what do they want. What kind of role would they like to have? And try to accommodate that. Uh, in our ways of work. So there is a number of um, points highlighted to us uh, how we can do better and, and uh, also in very con concrete actions how we can do better. better. And now Helen will be uh, presenting you of one concrete example of doing it completely differently, thinking completely differently of guiding uh, and girl scouting. So please, Helen. Good morning, everybody. Lovely to join you this morning. Um, I've been involved in growing guiding in the United Kingdom for five years. 
and it really stemmed from the fact that in my area, where we have about five and a half thousand uh, young people who want to be part of guiding, and unfortunately we have another thousand who would have liked to be part of guiding, but we don't have a space for them. So I started off this project thinking it was all about the girls and that the challenge I had was to create space for girls to get into guiding. So it's quite interesting when I reflected back after the first two projects that we launched in Gloucestershire that in fact it turned out to be just as much about volunteers and um, our leaders as the girls. And I think um, sometimes it's, you know, you feel lucky you can solve both problems in one go. But particularly today, I'm going to talk about both aspects of it, but focus primarily on what I think we've learned about um, finding and using leaders in Gloucestershire in a different way. Could we move on, Zoe? So Gloucestershire is part of Girl Guiding in the UK, so we've been going well over 100 years. And... I think if Baden Powell looked around today, he might see things that he would seriously recognize as being very similar to guiding um, in the early days. So most of our leaders tend to be um, older women. They may be mothers. They may have been um, guides in the past. And we usually meet on a weekday, so a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and occasionally Fridays after school. Uh, for the youngest girls, our five-year-old rainbows, that would typically be about five o'clock in the afternoon. And as they get a bit older, the brownies perhaps meet at 6.30 or 7, and then the guides on to 7.30 and so on. The biggest problem we therefore had with our rainbows, our five-year-olds, because they do actually go to bed at about 7, 7.30 at night, was that at five o'clock nowadays, very, very many women are still at work. Um, if you're a teacher, you may just about get home from school in time, but most office-based jobs or jobs in shops and the like, um, women aren't free at five o'clock. They may, or if they are, they're coming home to look after their own children, make tea and, and fill in their evenings. So we have a very big issue with what we do with the five-year-olds who'd like to join guiding as a rainbow. And the solution we decided to pilot was to open on a Saturday morning. Now, Saturday is obviously a day when, you know, most, a lot of people who work think, gosh, this is great, it's my day off. And yet we actually found that in finding leaders, say rainbows, was a lot easier than we expected. This unit opened up with two leaders who had had to leave rainbow leadership because they could not get there on a weekday after work. They couldn't still get to bring those at five o'clock. So that's two of our leaders, one of whom is a doctor, uh, the other um, works in an office. We also have students. We're very lucky that we live near a university campus, and we actually found that students quite like the idea of coming in on Saturday morning rather than coming in um, after lectures when maybe they were trying to do um, essays and so on, or they had a deadline to do. So our Saturday Rainbows, we opened up very near our shopping centre. Um, the programme is exactly the same as any other Rainbow programme, except that the girls only come every two weeks. So our leaders don't have to give up every weekend, they just come in every two weeks, and the programme runs for two hours. Next slide. So the benefits we found, first of all, it's convenient for parents. Parents love dropping the girls off and the mums go off and have a coffee or go and do their shopping and come back two hours later to collect them. The girls themselves are much less tired. We sort of forget a five-year-old is still quite a little girl sometimes. Uh, as we said, the leaders who finish work late normally um, can make time on Saturday morning. Students can get their assignments done. They can still sleep in on, a, on a, um, a Sunday and get their assignment ready for Monday. I also think what it's shown us that 
sometimes with our, our little girls, because they're tired, we normally only meet for about an hour or maybe an hour and a quarter, they're actually able in a two-hour meeting to get a much richer content um, to the program. We don't have to start and stop continually. Uh, you can actually put um, an activity in which may last for a whole hour, and the girls can do so much more. I don't think that's, you know, that doesn't say a short meeting isn't a good one, but I think we found the longer meetings can be better. So that was the first thing that we trialled, and that is running and running extremely well. We've now got um, several of them running. Next slide, Zoe. My argument is it would work for any age group. Um, the next one we came up with, again, is sort of completely off the wall, which is thinking, if I've got all these girls on a waiting list, isn't it sad that they may have to wait for six months, nine months, 12 months before they can have a chance to become a brownie? And yet, we really do have a problem that most of the units are very full. And so we start to think, where could we find more leaders from that weren't already very, very busy? doing guiding, and this was our idea. Um, we are actually joined on the, um, this session today by one of my holiday brownie leaders, so I'm hoping later on when you have questions, um, she'll be able to join in and answer some of them from her perspective as a leader and as a student leader. Thank you. Next slide. So this is what holiday brownies looks like. And I hope as you reflect back on some of the things that Heidi said about the need to be fun and relevant, um, these things will come through to you in the story. Next one, please. So what is Holiday Brownies? Well, the challenge that I set to the students was to think about providing a three-day kind of immersive brownie program. So what it really is, if you think about it, is 12 brownie meetings squished into, 12, into uh, three days. Most brownie meetings are about an hour and a half, so I, what I've asked the um, organisers to think about is, well, between arrival and the morning break, that's one meeting, then between morning break and lunch, that's the second, between lunch and the afternoon break, that's your third meeting, and then between afternoon tea and when they go home, that's your fourth meeting. So if we do that, we actually give the brownies the equivalent of one whole school term worth of meetings in three days. So even if they then have to wait again to get into brownies, they've had the equivalent of a whole term's worth of program content. We use ordinary um, girl guiding resources. The first one is called Becoming a Brownie, which is all about exploring the promise, learning the brownie story, um, understanding about world guiding um, at a level that's appropriate for seven or eight year olds. And what we call an interest badge, I know other countries call them different things, but it's the kind of the individual awards you can get around different subjects like a first aid badge or a cookery badge. But we have one called Brownie Skills Badge, which is a little bit of a mix, mix and match package of learning anything from knotting to healthy eating to how to write a letter. Um, the way we design all of our programs is what we call the five essentials, which is all about um, having the girls work in small groups and make decisions and so on. And I also said, you know, we, when we started this up, we just openly advertised it. We have no idea who would turn up, um, but we did agree with uh, ahead of time that we would be a self-funding program so that the people who came to the program would pay but what they're paying is the equivalent of those 12 ordinary brownie meetings. So again, we're trying to get them used to the fact that there is a subscription to pay when you go to a, a regular brownie meeting, and we pitched our cost at exactly the same level, and I asked the students who were running it to budget at that level, so it really was like an ordinary brownie program. Thank you. Next slide. So this is Jane, and just a few more images from our day. Um, you'll notice, well, you probably are not all familiar with what the British brown uniform looks like, but it's not a purple T-shirt. Um, but our view was that these girls haven't yet made their promise. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. 
Um, and we don't expect girls to go out and buy a whole brown uniform until they're sure they want to be brownies. Um, so again, the students said, well, why don't we come up with a bright t-shirt that they can all wear, a bit like a uniform, but much less expensive. Next slide. So when we looked around at all the girls that had signed up to come, we realized we'd managed to cover nearly 100 square miles. They were coming all, in from all directions, um, both small village unit or girls who might want to join a small village unit, but also then from those from our bigger towns and cities. Uh, we had said that in, if anybody couldn't afford to pay for the program, um, we would find a way that they could take part. So in one case, we funded part of the program, and in another case, because the girl had been recommended by the social services to join us, because they felt it was very important to her with the difficulties she was experiencing at home, they paid the cost. We had one girl who came with um, severe learning difficulty, and we'll see a bit more about that later. We had girls of various faiths, and we had a little bit of a mix of ages, not just brand new seven-year-olds waiting to join Brownies, but some who'd been waiting one, two, or even three years to get into Brownies. So some of them were a little bit older. So I think when we had our group that turned up for the first program, it really was about as typical a group as you could have at any possible Brownie unit uh, that you might have anywhere in our county. Thank you. Okay, so this is what makes it unique. There's another one or two. There we go. Um, this is now this has now been running for three years, and over the three years, all of these um, students have been making this program happen with very very little help or in from anybody else. Next slide, please. So the girls on the screen you see there are all students. They all have a family home in Gloucestershire, but they're away studying anywhere from uh, Wales to Leeds to, um, we had one in Queensland for a year in Australia. Um, it really doesn't matter because one thing that students tend to do is bring their laundry home in the summer holidays. And nowadays it's much harder to get jobs in the summer holidays uh, than it used to be, and so there's a little bit of spare time on their hands. Now, I knew a number of these girls personally, um, others brought along their friends. None of them, so they're all student age, so aged about 18 to 23, some had done their leadership qualification in, in guiding before they started, but only one had actually completed all, all four elements of it. Um, but I trusted them to plan, design, and run the program. Um, and I have to say, they did an amazing job, such a good job that this program has now been running, we've now had five programs, and um, it is taking off in other parts of the country. Thank you. Next slide. So we get, them together, we get the girls together for three days, and we give them that great experience. And I hope, if time permits, at the end of this session, after the question and answer, um, either we'll have time to show you the video or some of you can stay on and watch it, which actually gives you a real sense of the excitement and the enjoyment that happens. But it doesn't end after three days, because we feel once we've got girls involved in guiding this way, uh, we need to continue to support them until such times as they do actually manage to get into a unit. Their name comes to the top of the waiting list. So we held Christmas brownies. Um, so our Christmas programs are all about, again, what you would normally, a brown unit would normally do at Christmas, which would be perhaps to do some activities, make some Christmas gifts, go and do some carol singing, go to a pantomime. Uh, we had half term and Easter brownies where they worked on different badges like the disability awareness badge, um, the numeracy badge, all sorts of different things. Whatever we whatever we ask the girls what they would like to do, we give them a choice, and then they will come back to us and say, this is what we'd like to do, and then we try very hard to make that happen. We make sure the girls get invited to any of the events that are being run locally. Um, 
where a unit might be able to squeeze in an extra one or two. So, for example, a Thinking Day event. We made sure all of our holiday brownies were invited to join a Thinking Day event near to where they lived. But on Thinking Day, all my students are back at university, so it means working with other leaders, but that's not typically a problem. We've also got our virtual brown owls. The whole of Holiday Brownies pretty much got organised on social media. The leaders got together, discussed it, planned it, shared all their ideas. And it wasn't really until about a week or so before the programme ran that they actually met face to face. And then they mostly had to go shopping. Um, but realising, of course, nowadays, um, it's quite normal to connect over FaceTime or Skype with others. Um, we've, we connect some of the long the brownies who are stuck on the waiting list with the, brown, with the girls who ran the programme, who they call their brown owls, and they will arrange with their parents to have a Skype call every month or so to have a chat about what they're doing, um, to see if they can encourage them or help them with any new brownie badges they might like to do, um, tell them about events that are coming up, and just generally encourage them to continue to, to stay with brownies until they get in. In the second and third year, we, brought, we invited some of our brownies back who'd come in the first year, um, and they come and help out. Um, we've also trained them to, um, to become our sixth, so our junior leaders within brownies, and this is working really well. So we're, again, girls that are still two years um, have chosen now actually not to join regular brownies, they just want to stay as holiday brownies because it fits their time. And they're busy in the term time, so they just want to come and help in holiday brownies. And if that works for them, that's fine by us. Uh, we've also trained some of them as spokespeople because they've been out and talked at conferences around the UK about being a holiday brownie. Because I think it's their story which really helps people understand that it is something which works for girls as well as for leaders. Thank you. So summing up the benefits of holiday brownies, which, as I say, is just a different way of delivering brownies. We get the girls into brownies. They want to be brownies. And the way we work with them with virtual brown owls and interim programs, when they stay with guide and they don't often join the Boy Scouts or the Boy and Girl Scouts in the UK. Thank you. We also found that one of the obstacles to getting girls to get into brownies was they all wanted to go to the popular unit. They wanted to go to the ones where they, their friends were, which meant that some units had very long waiting lists. Other units didn't have. They had lots of gaps. What we have now, of course, is a group of girls with brownies who've got new friends, and we invite up the leaders of units that have got spaces. So you really put the question to the girls, do you want to go back on the waiting list, or would you like to join a brown unit with your new friends next week? And the answer generally is, can we start next week? So we fill up units with spaces and get rid of the problem for the units that have got long waiting lists. So that's working well. Next. I think this is where we really start to focus, though, on why this makes a difference. It's very easy, I think, for girls at 18 going off to university, starting new things in their lives, to leave guiding behind. They may have thoroughly enjoyed it as a young member, but life begins to change. All we're asking here of our students is when they come back home to give us about five days a year, three in the summer holidays and one in a couple of the other holiday periods. And for that, their membership continues. If you think about it, as we said, the way the brown, we look at it with brownies, it's a whole term's worth of meetings. That, so these leaders are not shirking their responsibilities. They're giving us a great quality of time. Um, but they stay connected to guiding. And I think there's a much higher chance that when they finish as students, they will go back when they start a job and settle in a new area. They will go back and become a guide leader again. You can ask Emily whether that's her plan. We have now got all of our student leaders as fully qualified Brownie leaders. They were able to complete every element of the UK's adult leadership program through Holiday Brownies because it's real Brownies. Some of them have gained qualifications in running outdoor activities, which again, they can use now um, 
and they certainly are able to talk about what they have done and how they have done it on their CVs, on application forms for courses or application forms for jobs. Thank you. And for us, it really has got people in Gloucestershire now talking about different ways to deliver guiding. This whole idea that we can be so much more flexible in our approach. It isn't about having to meet every Tuesday evening at 7 o'clock and that's the only way you can do brownies. Or Mondays at 5 o'clock is the only way you can do rainbows. And what we're showing is that it works for girls, it works for parents, and it works for the leaders. So we're carrying on and trying all sorts of different ways of delivering guiding differently to get more girls and more leaders feeling that it works for them. Thank you. So I think it's back to Heidi. Thanks, Helen. Um, so there was a, um, a very concrete example of, of a whole new way of doing guiding um, and uh, doing a successful guiding. So in a, in a bit, you will have chances to ask and pose some questions and comment on what you've just heard. But I will quickly run through what the WAGS task group on volunteerism is doing to enhance volunteerism in WAGS that is in the movement. So one thing that we are currently preparing is a, a vision for volunteerism. Uh, quite a number of MOs have asked us that they would need some kind of descrip uh, description or a, a statement on what volunteerism is all about when they go to recruit new volunteers or when they go to talk about guiding uh, with external actors such as governments or other NGOs. So there is a, a vision for volunteerism is being prepared in order to be used and adapted uh, in the different cultural situations of, of our many different MOs. Uh, the idea in this vision for volunteerism is two ways. Uh, it does not only set out how WAGs will support volunteers, but it also shows what we as WAGs expect in return from the volunteers. So it talks about sort of um, rights and responsibilities of the volunteers. Another really exciting thing we are working on are the training modules and sessions. Um, we are trying to create um, uh, training sessions to be used and facilitated in the MOs by the MOs uh, so that they can work on with these questions and these challenges. Because clearly there are some common challenges shared by all the MOs uh, and the challenges that we, we just uh, talked about earlier during this webinar. And the thing is that uh, even though the challenges are very similar, the answers might not be. Holiday brownies and Saturday rainbows certainly is an enticing idea, but it might not work as such uh, uh, in another cultural situation. But uh, it can act as uh, inspiration for all of us. So the training modules uh, that will be launched during this summer uh, are there not to provide solutions, but to assist MOs to find local solutions by exploring situation of their uh, special MO. Uh, thank you. The next slide, please. Uh, MO to MO connections on the hub is something that our MOs have been asking us from. We know the crucial importance of the MO to MO exchanges during conferences and during seminars, um, even during webinars like this. So we are trying to uh, find ways for MOs to connect with each other um, outside conferences and seminars, by webinars like this, by Skype connections, um, uh, and, and, and make it, uh, make it easy, easy access meetings for MOs to share best practices and, and be inspired by each other. 
Another, another thing that many MOs have been asking about are some advocacy resources for enhancing volunteerism. Of course, there already are a number of resources on enhancing volunteerism, but what especially is needed are uh, uh, materials for advocacy work on volunteerism, because uh, it has been shown that not all cultures, not all MOs, not all uh, countries offer a, a valuable or uh, a good environment for volunteerism to flourish. So that's why uh, MOs need to, many MOs feel that they need to advocate on volunteerism with their uh, local and national political act too. So the idea is that WAGS will provide some advocacy resources for that kind of work as well. In addition, we are preparing guidelines to reflect on diversity of volunteers, because when we talk of growing volunteerism and enhancing volunteerism, uh, it's clear that many of our MOs even though globally we seem very diverse, but nationally we might, or locally we might not be that diverse. So with these guidelines, uh, MOs are offer tools to get to the next level of membership growth by opening up with regards to um, diversity of volunteers. Because the diversity of volunteers will be diversity of uh, members, girls and young women as well. So thank you very much. That was uh, all for now for this webinar. And the next steps, we like webinar peeps. We, me and Helen, we will be having this webinar uh, one more time, just in a couple of weeks' time. The exact date is still uh, undecided, but uh, we figured out that this time works well for, um, for Europe and big parts of Asia Pacific and Africa and Arab region. However, this is not a convenient time for Western Hemisphere, also for the Western Hemisphere time zone in a couple of weeks' time. So if you are happy to have it, anyone can connect to that webinar too. And also another of live webinars are scheduled, uh, one on accrediting the guidelines and one on technology to support volunteers. So do stay tuned on, on the next webinar channel. And now we still have a place for uh, questions and comments. Our network is so many different uh, locations that the right answers to you, uh, you are the only ones to know the right answers, but you are certainly welcome to uh, ask for verification or from Helen or uh, present any comments you might have uh, gained during this video. Uh, please. Hello, can you hear me? Hello, Emily. Nice to hear yeah. from you. Yeah. Hi, Alan. Thank you for the information. God bless. No problem. My internet no, no. isn't very good, but I will try my best. Canada. Okay, they can start. Okay, they can start.
And thank you very much for the information that uh, was shared to us. Thanks. It was let thanks, Letty. It was nice having you here. Yes, yes. Thank you very much too. And Emily, please do. Sorry, can you repeat that, please? Yes, yes, Emily. Thank you very much. No problem. No, no, no. There is no problem. Emily, is there anything you would like to add as of the program? Um, I'm delighted you can join us. Uh, but are there things you'd like to say about how it's affected you as a leader and how it's encouraged you as a leader in guiding? Yeah, definitely. I went to university three years ago, so I graduated in the summer. I'm now on a gap year traveling, hence why I'm in Thailand. Um, I wouldn't still be involved in guiding if it wasn't for holiday brownies especially this year because uh, when I went to university I did join a different rainbow um, brownie unit um, in the county that I was at university in but especially now that I'm away out of the country I would not be even registered on go that means that when I come back in the summer I will be able to be a part of holiday brownies again And I'm looking forward to you being there, Emily. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so it also means that I get to go back and see some friends that I've been organising holiday brownies with for years that I don't get to see at any other point during the year because they're at university or I'm out of the country or whatever. So it means that I get to go back and see some of my old rangers' friends that holiday brownies is mostly the reason why we're all still friends so like Helen was saying earlier uh, and Heidi was saying about how it's good for the volunteers to get something back for them as well um, I also completed m my leadership qualification for brownies because I was only a rainbow leader before so it means that I could work on that for myself as well and there was a couple of other leaders as well who weren't going to complete their leadership qualification, but because they were doing holiday brownies anyway, it um, gave them an opportunity to complete many of their leadership sections. Um, so now there's some volunteers that still come back year after year because they are now a big part of it. So I think that's really important as well. Great. Thank you very much, Emily, for for these insights in how it's how it's been to actually do and run holiday holiday brownies. Now I can see there's a, a question from Becky on the uh, on the chat about where there are any specific areas and skills North Star and or the task group think we should focus on when offering volunteer development opportunities. Um, so the, the five areas that the, the North Star report uh, commented on were the time utilization, meaning that uh, the volunteers, they have not so much time anymore, so we really need to think how, how much time can we ask uh, the volunteers to devote on guiding. The one thing was the socialization that uh, the volunteers not only want to offer guiding opportunities for others, but they want to uh, have uh, time to socialize with other volunteers too. So we need to uh, simply offer those spaces for volunteers to socialize with each other. And then was the one was the recognition and rewards, not maybe simple monetary rewards, but diplomas or certification of skills is something that so many volunteers around the world are asking uh, from us. And then there is the self-development. Uh, the volunteers want to gain some some useful knowledge, useful skills from guiding uh, 
um, for their self-development, what those uh, special skills or developments is exactly could be remains open and to be uh, found out by by the different fields. And I then also the entry and re-entry. Oh, yeah, the entry and re-entry was the last aspect that uh, North Star pointed out for us. Yeah, go on, Helen. I think the important thing to think is um, important thing to we're trying to develop the whole person, um, as we would say that with brownies or guides. So it's whilst it's important that we go through process and procedure and rules and regulations, I think it's also important that we focus on ways in which the individual can gain skills, and that might be public speaking, it might be in um, teamwork, it might be in broader leadership, and those are all useful attributes which come back into guiding for us. But rather than perhaps always doing every training and every opportunity in uniform and making it feel incredibly guiding-centric, I think the more we can offer opportunities um, for our leaders to develop more broadly, um, the more value it is to them and ultimately the more value it is for us. Great. That, that was a good way to summarize it. It's a value. The best thing is when we get value to us all, not only to us uh, as a movement, but also to the volunteers themselves who, in the end, are part of the movement. At this point, I'd like to inform you that we have the one hour time limit. So I want to thank you all very much for joining in and taking this opportunity to learn more about inspiring and new ways of doing writing uh, in our MOs. There is still a, a short film uh, that Helen has prepared on holiday brownies. So those of you who would like to stay in and watch the film are warmly welcome to do so. But if you have an other engagement you need to go to, so you are free to do so. Thank you very much and hoping to see you again sometime in a webinar or in any other WAGS event.